let's have a look at custom replication options within Cassandra, as this may be something that's of interest depending on your configuration. So let's label this custom replication, in particular with the property file snitch. As we've alluded to thus far, Cassandra uses snitches to inform it about the location of resources throughout the Cassandra cluster. And of course, those resources may span data centers or be confined to a single data center. By default, as we've mentioned, all nodes are treated as one or to belong in one data center on one rack, which is referenced by the simple strategy. So there is no differentiation between, say, nodes that are in maybe rack one versus two, data center one versus two. It's a flat approach to allocating resources for Cassandra. However, with custom replication in mind, we gain a more granular approach and control over Cassandra's behavior. So we're able to define or create user-defined information based on the network te topology. So it's network topology driven. And this customization can allow us to apportion hosts or label hosts based on their data centers and racks mapped to IP spaces. So presuming you are the network administrator, you should be able to allocate IP addresses to racks, data centers, and inform Cassandra, each of the nodes that make up your ring, of this information. Each node, upon invocation, if it uses the network topology and property file snitch routines, will read conf Cassandra topology.properties. This file will spell out the IP addresses and data center and rack locations of all nodes that belong to the cluster, to the particular cluster. And this is, of course, read for requests and replication rules. So once you allocate nodes to data centers and racks, then Cassandra can more fine tune the various requests that it receives for reads and writes, of course. Now each key space, such as web app one, for example, must reference in this new model, DC and rack information. That is indicated, of course, in the Cassandra file, Cassandra topology. So again, it's the same file, conf Cassandra topology properties, which we're currently not using. It has some default values, but they're not read because we're not using the property file snitch. Let's just note that this is in stark contrast to the default simple snitch. which allocates all nodes in the cluster effectively to one DC, one rack. In actuality, the simple snitch is rack unaware, but in practice, it treats all the nodes as belonging to one rack, one DC. They're all lumped together. So whether you have six nodes or 6,000 nodes with simple snitch, Every single node belongs to the same data center within the same rack. And certainly that's not a realistic representation of your implementation. So simple snitch to reiterate does not recognize data center or rack information. It's a flat implementation of Cassandra resources or Cassandra cluster resources. Let's enclose this with single quotes.
to the left leading single quotes. So what's left for us to do to make this work? Well, we know currently we're in the flat structure. A number of ways we can tell. For example, when you execute node tool status, you see that all nodes belong to one data center by default, DC1. That gives us a sense as to the flat topography. To implement this, some things need to be done. We need to define the Cassandra topology.properties file to reflect the actual layout of our data center. So first, let's go ahead and note that we should update conf Cassandra topology.properties to reflect actual resource layout which may or may, include, may or not include multiple data centers. And as the administrator, this is information you'll have. Once that information is updated in the Cassandra topology file, we should then propagate it to all members in the cluster. So propagate to all nodes in cluster. Doesn't mean we restart Cassandra just yet. We simply populate it. And after we make the changes to the Cassandra YAML, will then restart the configuration and define our new key space. That leads us to a step three, which will be to update and propagate changes to conf Cassandra YAML. And then that'll lead us to a step four, of course, of a restart. So restart Cassandra instances confirm with, let's say, node tool, or if you're using data stacks with op center, and then finally define new key space and optionally alter an existing key space to have the configuration go through. So let's see what's in store. Let's take a look at UbuServe one, for example, navigating back into conf and we'll modify Cassandra topology. So this file needs to be spelled out, removing superfluous information. It's just basically a mapping between IPs, DCs, and racks. So we'll include our own comment, let's say classroom. And we'll use, let's say, those two entries as our model, removing the rest. There's a default hook here. So for example, if a node comes online and doesn't match one of the aforementioned, then it's automatically assigned to DC1 rack one. So for example, if you notice data distribution imbalances, it could be because a new node has not been explicitly listed in the topology file. Once you go with this particular model across all your nodes, be sure for each node that joins the cluster that a record is spelled out. So it shouldn't be too difficult, even for thousands of nodes. So let's build this out. Perhaps this will be for data center one. And the next block will be for data center two. So our nodes are located on the 75 network, beginning with 110. And let's say that this is DC1 for these three nodes. In fact, let's just cut and paste this and remove the last entry. So 110 through 112 will allow us to apportion things accordingly. And then maybe we take this block and distribute the CentOS boxes to the second DC. This is all, of course, make-believe as the nodes are truly within one data center, within one flat subnet, one broadcast domain. However, logically we can separate them as we see fit. So perhaps this becomes DC2, rack one. And of course you can spread things out a bit. So you could say, for example, that the nodes are distributed across racks with the notion being that racks tend to go down at the same time, bringing down, or a given rack tends to bring down resources on that rack. And if Cassandra believes or knows that there are resources that spread or are across racks, then the replication can be configured in a smart way. So maybe if you're spread across two, three, four, or more racks, then that way your data will survive the failure of, let's say, one or more racks, which again is usually unusual, but could happen. So this is data center two, for example. So just graphically a quick note. So as it stands, we have a ring which actually exists on a flat subnet, the 75 subnet we've spelled out. And historically throughout our studies, 
all six nodes have belonged to one data center, one rack, as referenced by the simple strategy, which ignores rack and data center information. So they're effectively treated as one rack, one data center. So now we'll segment the ring into, let's say, two rings. The Ubuntu boxes, 110 through 112, will become logically data center one. And the CentOS boxes, 120 through 122, will become logically the second data center and will allow us to replicate key spaces accordingly. So we can contain, let's say, key spaces to a given data center, let's say DC1, with maybe a one node backup in DC2 and vice versa. Maybe some data should be available in DC2 with a rep factor of three and then maybe a rep factor of one over in DC1. So it gives us more granularity, more flexibility in propagating our key spaces. So presuming that this looks good and the data centers are spelled out, we can then go ahead and save changes. Now, if a default node is to be a part of us, say, instead of DC1 R run, maybe DC1 rack one, that's fine as well. Just spell it out so that new nodes, if they join, at least belong to one or the other. So that'll save the changes. This now becomes a model that can be propagated to remote systems. So let's go back to our notes. Now we know for propagation, we use PSSH or perhaps Puppet. So we'll do something like a parallel SCP, for example. And we'll have all of these items copied over, prompting for the password. We'll reference our host file that we created earlier. That's the CAS hosts. Login as a user Cassandra on each node. Copying over Cassandra topology dot properties to the full path on the remote system, which we'll tab out momentarily. So we'll just end it here and then include it as part of the command that we make momentarily. So before we do the parallel CP, let's just update our cast hosts file to reflect all nodes in the cluster, maybe sans our home node. So in temp, we've got our cast hosts and in it, two, three, let's make Linux CBT sent one through three. This will cover the five nodes since we're making changes to the primary node. Then let's get that back into the buffer since we've overridden it. Actually, that's a control case. It hasn't overridden it, so this should be ready to go. So let's copy this to remote systems. It's going to be the full path. It's going to be Cassandra plus the version information. So home, Cassandra, Cassandra, and just navigate all the way through conf. And this is where we want to place the Cassandra topology properties file on each of the nodes. Now, presuming all the passwords are correct, this should just copy everything over momentarily. Let's see what it comes back with. Each of these are dumping, so let's see what we've got. I want to log in, Cassandra topology, and maybe the password was specified incorrectly, so let's just double check that. Try it again. And it dumps out again, so let's just double check. So since the password seems to be okay, let's see what's going on with the command A. Cassandra Topology, that's the problem. Wrong file name. So let's get that going. I'm actually using wireless keyboard. The battery is probably a bit weak because the O character seems to conveniently be missing. So let's try this again. And also that could beg questions surrounding inserted passwords. Maybe some characters have been omitted as a consequence. So now it's successfully been copied. So we've got the topology file updated. Next step is to modify each, and this could be done through Puppet or perhaps from the local system and propagated similarly, so long as you make changes to the bind address so that there's no conflict. So maybe it's easier for us to just stop Cassandra in each node and update those entries manually. So Cassandra YAML needs to be updated accordingly. What we want to do is change the endpoint. So update endpoint snitch to reflect our new entry, which will be for the property file. So property file snitch, which by the way, the examples are there. So we need not memorize it, but it's simply going to be property file snitch. This tells Cassandra to read this file that we've just propagated, which is Cassandra topology. So if we begin with our local system, let's modify Cassandra YAML. 
search for endpoint. That takes us to the area immediately where we can include a comment. And there are, of course, more elegant ways. For example, you could use sed as part of your parallel SSHs to make changes to wherever it finds endpoint snitch, for example. This simply becomes property file snitch. And there are other snitches supported. Just read through the documentation. For example, if you're using AWS, then there are two snitches built in for dealing with EC2 so that you can propagate your data across regions, as well as gossiping property file snitch, which uses the rack DC file and defaults to the, the property file snitch file that we're using Cassandra topology properties in the event that the other file doesn't exist. So it uses it as a back, uses it as a backup. And there's also, of course, the default simple snitch, which treats everything as local. So this is a directive that can be impacted on the remote system. Again, a quick set with parallel SSH could update this as well. So we'll save the changes here. Now on each node, since we'll have to stop them anyway, and we have windows into them, let's kill each instance and update accordingly. Because in order for these changes to be read, we'll need to restart each instance. So beginning with this instance, let's modify conf Cassandra YAML in search of endpoint, for example. And that should take us to this area. Endpoint snitch will become what's in memory with a simple comment. And then we'll just take this whole block and paste it across all of them. Again, Puppet could be useful here to propagate these changes from a master server. Let's save the changes. This is almost ready to be fired up. Let's just confirm our settings after, but we'll make changes to each accordingly before firing them. Before you get your cluster back up, also always ensure that things are intact, that you do a double check to make sure that you haven't included any rogue settings that could blow your configuration. So let's control shift V and just remove this last entry. So that's that node. And then on sense one through three, and certainly for a bigger cluster, this is not going to work. You're going to have to use parallel SSH to make these changes. Let's paste this in, but for six nodes, it's not a problem. And we'll get rid of that one. And two more nodes to go, so endpoint snitch. And the endpoints, of course, are nodes. It's just another way of saying nodes within the Cassandra realm. So paste that in and sent three conf Cassandra YAML. Now it is suggested that when implementing new Cassandra instances that you consider going with network topology as opposed to simple snitch, but because you're likely to find a mix of configurations, it's always a good idea to have a look at the default, which is simple snitch, as opposed to delving directly into other snitches, such as AWS related, network topology related, otherwise. So if we arbitrarily took sent to, for example, and cat the contents of conf Cassandra topology, we should witness that the nodes are spelled out for the different data centers, which node tool with the status option will reflect. So if it's arbitrarily here because of the success we saw with parallel SSH or parallel SS SCP, it should reflect accordingly. Now, the key spaces, the default key space for us web app one is defined to use the simple snitch. So we'll have to redefine it using an alter command. What we'll do is begin with a new key space. Let's call it web app two. It could be maybe a storage repository for maybe subscriptions, for example, simple data. We'll define it outright to include the network topology strategy and then see how it performs and then alter the original key space. So with that, we should fire the instances back up that'll get that going. It should come up rather quickly. Listening for thrift clients, that's rather quick. Cassandra F, we're in the current bin directory there. So Numino DOS is up. Let's see what's going on here. This is relative to this directory. This should come up quickly as well. And then three more nodes to go and we should be in business. 
So that's going to come up. This is taking a little longer, so we'll give it a little more time. Let's just check where we are on our list of items. So we're restarting the Cassandra instances. That's good. Confirm with node tool status. This should reveal the new DC layout. Not rack layout, but DC layout, indicating that they're part of two different data centers. Now that this node is on its way to being up, let's move on with sent to. It's enough of a gap, so we'll just spin Cassandra F on this node as well and get that fired up. And let's see where we are. So we've updated this to include, let's just note, allocate all nodes in cluster to respective DC and rack information. Propagate with parallel SCP, and this should be topology with a no as opposed to topology. And update Cassandra YAML to indicate the new endpoint snitch being property file snitch. If you're using AWS, have a look at the snitches related to AWS which allows Cassandra to differentiate between the various AWS instances as they're spread across regions and so on. So let's get Cassandra F going here. This will be our last node. And then as this comes up from the perspective, say, of node one, let's have a brief look. Maybe we'll navigate back into bin at node tool status to get a sense for what the cluster looks like now. And as you can see, things are spread across two data centers which is essentially what we want. So no tool status returns in between single quotes, the following information. And for n number of data centers that you have globally dispersed, you'd simply map them out in a file that perhaps is managed by Puppet with respect to distribution. So in this dump, all six nodes are up. Three Ubus belong to rack one in data center one. Rack one, data center two. So status is actually giving us rack information as well with the breakout of the data. Now, question remains or question that's outstanding at this point is what happens to the original key space, that simple meaningless key space called web app one? Well, let's just note before we define a new, new key space note that at this point, the original, albeit simple key space, of web app one is still DC agnostic because of the simple strategy that's in use that was defined when we initiated that key space. So what does that mean? It still means that the replication factor will span data centers. So let's just note this means that all nodes, regardless of DCs and or racks, will be included as part of the replication strategy. Up to, of course, the replication factor value. So, Let's confirm what that happens to be from where we left off. So let's do a SQL shell and then describe the key space web app one. And the rep factor is four. So obviously that means of the six nodes, three from one data center and one from the other will be used to replicate the data. How can we confirm what the current replication distribution is? Node tool get endpoints for the key space web app one for the column family users and for the key for that column family username. And this shows that it spans, as you can see, the two data centers, the logical data centers, 120, 121, and 122 being members of DC2 with 112, the lone member of DC1. So in this distributive scenario, distribution scenario, our data will persist the failure of one logical or physical data center. But of course we have more control 
if we alter the key space information. Now, before we alter, which is essentially an update to the schema for Web App 1, let's move on to defining a new key space because this gives us a fresh area. So let's say we need a new key space to store some subscription information. To find new key space, let's call it Web App 2 to hold subscriptions. Let's say Web App 1 users subscriptions. And the list could go on and on, which could warrant a separate key space altogether. So to create a key space, it's obviously going to be create key space. The name of the key space, let's say, is Web App 2, which is like or not synonymous with or analogous to a database container with replication and all that comes with and in between the curly braces. So that tends to include the class of replication, which for us is going to be network topology strategy. And again, we could simply cat this all out or tab it all out and then copy it over to avoid any errors. Network topology strategy. And then we specify the replication across data centers. So let's say these tables or data included within Web App 2 should replicate primarily to DC1. So maybe DC1 rep factor three, this is the rep factor effectively. You don't actually specify the name rep factor, just the number associated with the DC and then Cassandra handles the distribution of the keys for you magically. And then let's say cross DC2, which is optional, you don't need to specify it. We'd like to have it mirrored twice. So this would perform that sort of replication for us. Let's get a SQL shell instance going and go ahead and create the key space web app one tab it out replication class if you just tab as if you would from the bash shell you'll see the options that are available so network topology strategy then we need to specify the dc name so let's say dc1 is the primary dc and we'd like to have a factor of three and then you can continue specifying other dcs optionally such as dc2 We'll go with a rep factor of two or maybe one, but usually two is a minimum for redundancy, and then we'll close this out. So this will create a key space that will attempt to, and that should be actually web app two, to replicate across the data centers accordingly, and that's more like it. So now, if we describe the key spaces that are defined, we should see that web app two exists. Nodes should reflect either on standard out if you're using Cassandra foregrounded as we have been throughout our studies or in the log and or in the log file as is the case behind the scenes. So now we have this new key space. It has no table. So let's create a table to store, let's say the subscription. So that's going to be something along the lines of a create table. Maybe we'll call it subscriptions and maybe in subscriptions we define maybe two columns maybe the name of the subscription and the URL associated with it, or maybe the name, the username, and maybe the actual URL. It depends on how you like to structure it. For example, if each row should be unique to each user, it could also be username. That's fine as well to make it key, followed by maybe the subscription name, followed by maybe the URL. But if the key is going to be the username, then you won't be able to create entries twice for a particular user. So you could have the name of the subscription, say, be the key name, which could be some unique value, followed by perhaps the username and the URL. Or it could simply be an identifier that's based on an integer. Maybe it's a big int, and that becomes unique, followed by the other values. So you could, for example, say, sub id big int and that will just keep track of the distinct id values followed by and this could be the primary key in and of itself so primary key or you can make a composite depending on how you like to structure it followed by maybe the subscription name that's the actual name let's say of the service that's being provided and maybe it's of type text followed by maybe the url which is also of type text which should define the table for us. The structure is not of concern to us. It's rather the distribution of the data. So how you lay out your data is entirely up to you. Now let's use Web App 2. That would help, or we'd have to qualify the create table statement. 
And then let's do a describe tables. And that shows subscriptions. So if you describe table subscriptions, you should see its columns, which includes, of course, the subscription ID, subname, URL, so on and so forth, can be stretched out as necessary. Now, again, the replication information isn't tied to the table, but rather to the key. So if you describe the key space, Web App 2, this tells us how things are to be replicated. So Rep Factor 2 and DC2, Rep Factor 3 and DC1, and that gives us a new table. Now, what about data? Should we insert some sort of values into it and confirm its presence across the wire? Certainly. So you could attempt to see how the keys are being distributed across nodes currently using the node tool get endpoints, for example. So let's quit quickly before we insert anything to see what's possible. Let's do a node tool, get endpoints. Let's say for web app two, now the column family is called subscriptions and the key is sub ID. This is what's actually spread across all of them. Now let's just double check. This is throwing an error on trying to convert it to a long type which could be rectified by perhaps either creating a composite key or creating a key on something that's maybe text. Let's see if we're able to query based on say sub name. Now this is not a key that's or a primary key. So let's double check the structure. So it doesn't give us that nor for URL. So it would throw the same error. So this could become a problem depending on how Cassandra will handle this conversion. But insofar as inserting data, let's do a SQL shell. Now let's try to do an insert into subscriptions. So we'll use web app two first and insert into subscriptions, sub ID, sub name, and let's say URL, the following values. So maybe we'll start with one followed by maybe a sub name of maybe the following and maybe the following. And let's do a select star from subscriptions. And as far as the translations are concerned, that's something we can always figure out. Like this is a Java error concerning translations to long type. That's not a big problem for us to figure out. So long as the key for this particular table or column family suits our needs. It just needs to be a unique identifier. So if it's a username, then you can't have multiple records because it won't be unique. IDs can be unique, or maybe the combination of the ID and the user's username would make unique entries. In any event, rather than worry about data structure, let's worry more about the concepts of Cassandra and its replication. Let's insert another record, maybe We'll change this to another media provider, maybe the following, followed by its URL. And that'll insert, actually I'll update the existing. So let's insert again for BBC, make this ID number two. Again, the key is key. So once you specify the key, as we've alluded to earlier, Perhaps we didn't have an example to show, but as you can see, once you specify that key, instead of the insert, the insert becomes effectively an update. So we got two values, and however we map these back to users is besides the point. So now we've got some records going on here. As far as distribution now, these records will be distributed across the various fields. Now, across the various nodes in our cluster. Now, if we want to get around this long error, we could say, for example, make subname be key and ensure that each one is unique. For example, maybe it just becomes a lookup table for various media providers or subscriptions. And then we extend maybe the username as a separate column. So in that case, you would drop the table subscriptions and then recreate it using something that suits the translation from node tools. So let's create maybe this so the sub name will be of type text and primary key. The URL will be as follows. And then maybe the mapping becomes the username as type text, for example. And then this time we insert instead of with an ID, a leading ID, 
just as follows. Let's just correct this to be subname URL. And then let's do a select star. So that gives us, and for now we haven't mapped the user's name, so that's not an issue. Let's see the other value for BBC. That should be this one instead of a leading ID. This just makes it easier for us to get around the data concerns surrounding translations from one type to another. That's less of our concern. Let's do a select star. So we have two items, and now let's quit. And let's try to see if we can find out where these items are. So now we see with URL or maybe even sub name the distribution of our content. So the conversion from big end to long, that's neither here nor there. So we've asked for replication on the order of two in one data center, three in the other. So in the local logical, quote unquote, inverted commas, local data center, 110, 111, 112 are in DC1, rep factor three. And in the remote, inverted commas, data center, sense one and three, are the two nodes that have been selected. So the replication is now behaving as we expect. And again, node tool status will show us that truly these items are in different data centers. So 120, 122, that's data center two, two nodes, two factor that is, and 110, 111, 112. If we drop the rep factor using an alter, no problems there whatsoever. So SQL shell, and you just use web app two, and then alter table subscriptions or in this case since it's replication let's alter the key space web app 2 replication class network topology strategy this is going to be dc1 we still want to go with maybe three here maybe none in the other and then maybe in dc2 we go with one and then we'll do a disk key space web app two have a dump so now you'll get a rep factor of one across there how quickly it updates remains to be seen we'll do a no tool status no tool get me the endpoints for these and now it's already updated 110 111 112 and one in the other data center which of course will not survive a second data center fault but in the event of a failure in that node in the second data center so this we've updated from sub ID just because of the conversion issue to sub name and then URL. And then somewhere in our data, data model we'll map over say the username to make them unique. So let's say that we, as part of this, insert some data and maybe we'll just take the insert command that we've included earlier. So let's find that in our dump that should be somewhere up here that's what sub id so what we want is something like the following simple insert again the data are meaningless to us it's more about cassandra then alter the key space web app 2 to update the replication factors and that's just an alter key space command. So key space, let's just copy and paste this from the dump below. And that should be web app two with the following replication setting one for the one node. This gives us more flexibility. Now, if you check the Cassandra documentation, you'll see that precisely this is mentioned that it heightens. Let's just note that network topology coupled with property file snitch gives us improved or heightened horizontal scalability. And that should be obvious, of course, because again, with the simple snitch model, which relies upon the gossip protocol to make everyone essentially flat, all six nodes are treated as one, basically one rack one data center, one flat network. With network topology, we've now segmented logically these three from these three into two different data centers. And as a cluster grows, let's say from six to maybe 12 nodes, then those nodes can be placed in the key space configuration. So you'd simply update your key spaces to replicate 
across to the other data centers and other nodes accordingly. Your rep factors are tied per DC. So let's say you gain three nodes in DC1, maybe you up this to four or five. So horizontal scalability, basically, as nodes are added, you simply update the key space information to reflect how redundant the key space should be per data center. And of course the EC or Amazon Web Services snitches work in a similar manner, but it's just tied to the way Amazon distinguishes between the various nodes. Now, insofar as the existing key space, that's something we haven't looked at. So what about the original key space based on simple strategy? So let's confirm it. So a desk key space, for example, or describe key space web app one, which again is our meaningless key space with junk data, but it's now available everywhere, which is what Cassandra brings to us. So let's do a SQL shell. And let's look at this key space. As you can see, simple strategy. So this needs to be updated. But if you do switch strategies, then you'll need to run a node tool repair just to be sure that everyone's on the same strategy. So rep factors four, that means it should spread everywhere. It could even up this to six. So using an alter key space, for example. So alter key space, this is gonna be web app one and network topology strategy. Let's say DC one, we want maybe three. And maybe say we want in DC two, three. So it still benefits from having all nodes replicate the key space, however small or large or otherwise. So let's alter the key space and have a brief look at it once more. So now it's set to network topology, but to be certain that this is in effect, we should do a node tool repair. Now if you're in production and you're making these changes, then you shouldn't touch it. Wait till off peak. So otherwise you could influence negatively the performance. So this is updated. Next step for us is per node run node tool repair to ensure the new strategy is followed. So you can either do that from node tool on a single node connecting to each node or if you have an SSH shell to each do it and restart the instances. So on this node, let's say node tool repair. This will dump a lot of junk on the log interface for the instance to which it's connected, indicating any changes that are being made to make the key spaces consistent. Most of the work will be done on web app one because it contains the most data, however small. It's usually less than ideal to execute node tool repair simultaneously across nodes, so it should be done in a sequential fashion. Let's just note as well, run node tool repair in a sequential and if possible off peak. So sequential fashion. So per node we just run that and then eventually the data will be consistent. Just to be sure it's following the new strategy and then when we check the endpoints after all the node tools have been run, then we should see that the data are replicated to six nodes. So we'll let this run on and behind the scenes we'll have no tool repair run on the other five nodes. No tool repair runs automatically internally anyway, but if you'd like to expedite matters, this is the way to do it. So let's move on.